but I'm going to just start with a few questions that I've written to get things going. Um, and I'll no, no doubt have some follow-ups based on your responses. And I invite everyone on the panel to, um, even if I direct a question to one person, to feel free to respond or, or weigh in. Um, I thought it would be interesting if we start sort of broader and kind of maybe with a more um, topical part of a discussion that will then lead us sort of back to where uh, this movie starts. And we'll also talk about the filmmaking process, which is so exceptional in this movie. But, but I wanted to start in a more topical place. And so I'm going to look to Leslie Stahl to do that first. Uh, and I'll tell you why, because I think that um, as Charles depicts in this riveting film, um, and much of sort of what we're all observing and living with today, there's just so much that we're riveted by in the day-to-day -day cycle of news and information that is both related to um, what's happening in the White House and then even more recently in the last few days what's been happening with regard to the Supreme Court and how these stories may connect or relate to each other. Um, so I wanted to ask you a question, and that is, um, I wonder how you think uh, the broader political news of the past couple of weeks connects to the situation involving the president now, um, and especially in relation to how we're sort of, as a, as a public, trying to process it, connect with it, and understand it? Well, oh, I should know about microphones. <laughs> Can you hear? Bring it, bring it a little closer and you should be good. Can you hear? OK, good. Uh, well, I, I myself am just infused with the hearing I just saw. In fact, it took Thursday was a busy day for me, and I didn't do anything. So I had to make it up today, because I literally sat and watched the Kavanaugh hearings, uh, which weren't exactly like the Senate hearings, except that what has struck me since I saw, first saw Charles's film a few weeks ago, uh, is that things were pretty polarized back then, and particularly on the Senate committee, which I was the first thing I covered, and uh, the Democrats always protected their people, as happened here, and the Republicans protected their people, as happened here. And the country was extremely polarized back then. And it, I, I, my mind won't leave that p place, and hasn't since Tr uh, Mr. Trump has taken over the White House, that we have been polarized before. Uh, in fact, in some ways, it was worse back then because there was violence and there was a lot of marching in the streets. Um, and then we got Jerry Ford right after, and almost overnight, things ki kind of reverted. I, it's hard to say what would happen after what we are going through right now. But uh, I know Richard and I have different views on this, but I think... Uh, that there, there's, for me, watching the film and realizing that things didn't stay as bad as they were in terms of the country being divided and being at each other's throats and disagreeing with everything. It's pretty similar. And, and we did, for a time, work our way out of it. And that says to me that we were capable of that. I don't know if we can, but we are capable of it. The other thing is that, that I take great heart at in what's going on now is that things have changed for women. And women can make a charge and an accusation today against a man. She will be respected and believed. And so, you know, these hearings in one respect this time uh, left me feeling that, that may, we may be taking 10 steps back, but we're also taking two steps forward. Um, would anyone else like to comment on that? And then I have a follow-up, please. I, I, I think there's maybe not been quite as Leslie would describe it. 
I, I'm not sure I agree completely with Leslie. Um, I think there was a little bit of comedy shown when Senator Flake met with two Democrats. When Senator Flake I think it's the met with two Democrats and came back and said, we need to do due process, we have to have an investigation. That was a sign uh, for the first time in I can't think of how long that I felt that there was any sense of people talking to each other and compromising. Um, but I think there was actually during Watergate, the actual Senate hearings were much more, I think, um, looking for truth. There was no sense in this hearing no. that anybody was looking for truth. I, don't, I didn't feel that, and I covered it. I did not think there was a sense of looking for truth. I think the Republicans, with one exception, Lowell Weicker, yeah. were trying to protect the president, at least at that stage of Watergate. Things did change later on. That's true, but they did allow, for example, John Dean to testify and give the full facts. That's something here we're having two witnesses. The Democrats controlled yes. the Senate. That's a difference. Huge difference. <laughs> As a f just, just one quick thing. Please, yeah. uh, one uh, thing that may turn out to be a big difference in terms of bipartisanship is in the end, uh, seven Republican members of the House Judiciary Committee voted one of the articles of impeachment, six voted for the other article of impeachment, and that was, I think, out of 11. So that's a, a significant aspect of bipartisanship that it's hard to imagine that being replicated today. I just want to add a Oh, Richard, did you? I just add one point. I, I'm, I, I don't know that I can be as sanguine as Leslie about where we've come in terms of women's uh, credibility. I mean, it's one thing to say that um, Ms. Ford was a compelling witness, as the president did, and she's, uh, we have a lot of respect for her. But on the other hand, to say that of course, uh, Kavanaugh is being smeared. Doesn't show, it sounds like as people are speaking out of two sides of their mouths. And particularly when they don't want to have, a, a, didn't want to have a credible hearing, fact-finding uh, process. So I, I, I wish I could say that we move forward, but I'm not really sure we have because you would not, uh, I prosecuted hundreds, maybe thousands of sex crimes, assaults, and you would never take the word of the defendant, <clears throat> I didn't do it. That would not be the, if that ended your inquiry, <laughs> you'd be thrown out as a prosecutor. <laughs> but it's uh, ending the inquiry, well, they wanted it to end the inquiry here, and the f that you did no investigation would also be um, excoriated. So I, I, I find myself appalled um, and uh, we're talking about the U.S. Supreme Court, but there's one, I agree, there's one little opening here uh, in, uh, of uh, bipartisanship, and that happened on the House Judiciary Committee. I think, just to follow up on what Evan said, one important fact, I don't know if it was mentioned in the movie, I, I film, I don't re remember that, but the articles of impeachment, the ar very articles of impeachment were written by a group of moderate Republicans and conservative Democrats. That's very important to remember. I think the staff may have also had a hand in it, but Pick, the agreement up, of that was critical. Uh, uh, the agreement of, of the, um, the shaping of it, the ideology behind it, the Republicans and Democrats work together, and can we replicate that? I have no idea. Well, picking up uh, on that point, Liz, um, I think that shows uh, both where Leslie and Jill are both correct, but it is temporal. Uh, at the beginning, the Republicans were very much in line protecting Nixon. As time went on, and as more and more facts developed, and uh, largely through the efforts of the Special Prosecutor's Office in getting tapes and having the tapes hearing 
um, where the 18 and a half minute gap was discussed and the White House gave their ridiculous responses to what had happened to these unprotected tapes, uh, the public began uh, to question. And of course, the major uh, turning point, in my view, was uh, actually not the Senate hearings, but rather the Saturday Night Massacre, where millions of Americans reacted in horror as to uh, what their president had done, obviously in an effort to protect himself, firing the person who was duly charged with investigating. We don't like that as Americans, and we don't like it now when we see it. The idea of somebody uh, taking the uh, baseball home because he doesn't like how the game is going is not American. It is something that we revile. And the fair play that is associated with a fair and just hearing was what the country reacted to and properly asked, what was Nixon hiding? And the answer was, a lot. <laughs> and so I would say the, the real beauty and the lesson of Charles's film, to put this all together in the way he has, is that the ultimate result was a combination of a community of constitutional dimension each part playing its own role and making its own contribution from the beginning of the extraordinary reporting of uh, uh, Carl uh, Bernstein and Bob Woodward and the, and the courage of Catherine Graham to publish uh, the results uh, in a newspaper under dire threat of financial harm. Uh, all the way through the uh, Judge Sirica's hearings, the, the extraordinary Senate hearings, uh, Peter Rodino's leadership, Archie Cox and Leon Jaworski, and of course, Judge Sirica, um, who while uh, often criticized or uh, ridiculed uh, on the basis of his legal scholarship, absolutely as a Republican, could not tolerate the fact that he was being lied to in his courtroom and demanded further investigation. So that was a unique situation. Richard Nixon, as you've seen, made every wrong turn at every intersection. And without that, he might have survived if he had destroyed the tapes, as some had urged him to do. It's my view he would have uh, remained as president, although wounded, he would have served out his term. I, I don't want to take over your panel, but. Continue. <laughs> I'm basically a reporter, so can I ask a question Please. of all our lawyers here? <laughs> because, and I told Charles this when he interviewed me, when I sat in the courtroom with Judge Sirica, in the, in the early days when the, just the burglars were there, the original burglars, he took over the questioning from the prosecutor. And I sat there just uh, shocked. I didn't know a judge could do that. I didn't know a judge could just completely ignore and swipe away and criticize the prosecutor in front of the courtroom. So did he overstep his power, anybody? Well, a federal judge does have the power to ask questions. What happened in that courtroom was the result of a, uh, an individual who spent his life as a trial lawyer. He was a very street smart guy, Judge Sirica. And he sensed that something extraordinary was happening and he was proved true by the Nixon tapes. What had happened was the chief of the criminal division of the Department of Justice had issued orders about how far the prosecutors could go and what they needed to stay away from. And what they were staying away from was what Judge Sirica 
wanted pursued. And that okay. led to that. Who are the higher ups? Who are the higher ups? Exactly. Right. And, and then what happened was, right. as part of the sentencing, McCord wrote him a letter that said, Your Honor, you are correct. There were higher ups involved. Hush money was paid. That was the real break in the, the whole investigation. That happened before John Dean was cooperating. That's what really led to it, and it was his gut instinct to do it. And I'll point out where a judge oversteps, and I don't think that Sirica did, but Judge Ellison in the Manafort trial may have caused, could have caused an entire mistrial because he really overstepped when he would interfere and when he would say, well, Mr. Gates, obviously you didn't do such a good job or you couldn't have stolen so much money from Manafort. Whoa. So that's, you know, that's judges overstep. can overstep, they, but obviously he thought he had the power to do it and he did it. Can I just add one point to what you, uh, your um, r list that you mentioned, Richard, about where, by, where people s came forward, and that is, and it's particularly apt now, the U.S. Supreme Court, because the Supreme Court had the question before it as to whether to uh, allow the subpoena to be enforced by the grand jury seeking Nixon's tapes. And the Supreme Court ruled eight to zero, um, William Rehnquist recused himself, to allow those tapes to be released. There were Republicans on the US Supreme Court appointed by Richard Nixon. And I think it's really worth understanding that they put aside party loyalty, uh, who appointed them, to do the right thing. That's why the appointment was the appointment is so important. And before it got to the Supreme Court, judges who were appointed by uh, Republican presidents, such as John Sirica, such as on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, also ruled in favor of the special prosecutor getting the evidence that the grand jury had subpoenaed and later the trial subpoena that we had issued for uh, the tapes, which included, as it turned out, the so-called smoking gun tape. Now that obviously begs the question of what would happen today. Exactly. <laughs> obviously. That was the biggest difference between then and now, as it stands at the moment. And that is that the Republicans uh, are now in control when the Democrats uh, control the House and Senate there were serious, open, I believe fair, and uh, to some extent bipartisan investigations conducted. Notably, televised hearings by the uh, Senate, and that was going to be replicated under the leadership of Peter Rodino uh, as uh, the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee. I want to get to this question of connections between these two time periods. And it, it, I observe that it, recent news and certainly the, the events of just the past few days have depicted for all of us very clearly the complicated challenges that are currently facing all three branches of our government really right before us. We're seeing these cracks uh, in our system and we're, and we're thinking about what we'll be left with or what we'll have in front of us in the not too distant, distant future. So I wonder to what extent Watergate, um, did Watergate strengthen our system in any way to face these sorts of challenges um, that are being withstood right now? Did it reveal cracks and weaknesses that maybe um, we're, we're revisiting now? Um, I guess I'm trying to ask whether we're in a stronger or weaker situation for what's about to, to come. So at least we have a model where the press, the courts, the Senate, the House of Representatives all did what they're supposed to do. And it worked. The system worked. And uh, I think today a lot of people are worried that the system is not working. But at least there is a model that under very stressful political times, the system can work. And that's the story of Watergate. In terms of the press, uh, and I would say 
probably all the institutions. After Watergate, we were all strengthened. We were admired. Um, the public trusted us. Laws were passed. Uh, and time went by. And all of that has eroded. And I can say for the press, uh, we've lost our credibility. We're under attack. Uh, and I personally, obviously, worry for the democracy. But you could say that, I think, for most of the institutions. Do you think you've lost your credibility because you've done something or because Donald Trump has rallied so much against you and said, fake news, fake news, get those people in the back of the room? I think uh, it's been a process. Probably technology has had the most to do with it up to now. But I think, yes, we've taken a huge leap away from trust with Donald Trump's attacks, yeah. But I think that, that things were moving away from the public looking upon us as unbiased. There were so many outlets that are biased, and they're, they're almost labeled. But we all get tarnished by it. Um, I think that in the wake of Watergate, there were some very important reforms adopted. Campaign finance reform, because the hush monies were paid out of illegal campaign contributions. The special prosecutor legislation, independent special prosecutor, couldn't be fired by the president. I was one of the authors of that law with Senator Kennedy. Um, those are things that went into effect. The campaign finance laws, they were good when they first hit the books. Everyone's figured out how to do end runs around them. So these are issues that have to be revisited. The special prosecutor law, people wanted to junk that. Both Democrats and Republicans, now maybe people on this platform will disagree with me, but we've got to figure out some way to ensure that we can have proper, fair, professional investigations, whether the president is a Republican or is a Democrat or is a green or a pink or a purple. I don't care. That's what we need to have, and we don't have that assurance today. And I also want to say that it was horrifying to me to read that the very revered Judge Justice Sirica wrote an opinion he was the one dissenter in this, when the Supreme Court upheld the special prosecutor law. He Scalia. dissented. Sco oh, what? Scalia. That's what I said, didn't I? Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, I, I apologize. No, Scalia said that the president should not have a level playing field, that there ought to be a prosecutor who is favorable to the president. How about that? No level playing field, no equal justice. And Mr. Kavanaugh, said that he would like to finish the work that, that um, Scalia started and over t basically prohibit a fair and professional invest and thorough investigate and objective investigation of a president. That will take us down the road to tyranny. <clears throat> Charles, um, let me switch gears a little bit and, and ask you to give us a bit of context. Um, so much of what we're talking about on this panel um, shows us how much of a connection there is between this movie you've made, this time period you're exploring, and what we're all going through right now. You could not have imagined, I don't think, um, as brilliant as you are, <laughs> where we would be when you set out to make this movie. So please remind us when you set out to make this movie. What was the, the light bulb moment, part one? And then part two, can you give us a little bit of context um, about how you set about making some of the decisions, the narrative choices about what to include, what not to include, and how to shape what could have been a, a, a two-hour movie or what could have been an eight-hour movie, how you sort of settled on this approach? Well, uh, as, to, as to the genesis of this film and, and in its relation to what it became, um, uh, if there is a God, he has a, a very twisted sense of humor because someone played a major trick on me. Uh, I had the idea to make this film, uh, or to make a film about Watergate, uh, over five years ago. And 
uh, I would come back to it, you know, when I had time, and then I would be doing something else. And so, about three years ago, I decided to get serious about it. And uh, at that time, my motivation for wanting to do it was that I had made three films about three quite difficult films about quite difficult subjects, and I wanted something that would be lighthearted and easy. <laughs> And so I wanted to make something that had, that was a purely uh, n no current relevance that happened 45 years ago that was a real life political thriller that was, that had a lot of black comedy in it. Um, and it was on that basis that I began approaching people and that people were initially interested. And it was on that basis that this film was initially funded. And, uh, but that was in, what that would have been, I think, early 2016. And as time passed, you know, with every passing month, it became clearer and clearer that this could no longer be a lighthearted romp down memory lane. And so the film actually became something extremely different. Um, and uh, I, I decided that I, that I wanted to do and needed to do two things. One, was simply to show what had happened in this previous instance. And secondly, to investigate how all the questions we're facing now were handled then. And to show at least one example of how they were debated then and how they were handled then. Not always perfectly, but frequently quite well. And and one thing that I came away uh, feeling was the, the overall level of seriousness of purpose and integrity among the many people, including many people in government, uh, at that time when faced with these extraordinary facts. Not everybody at all, but overall it was impressive uh, that people often people with you know, very sort of ordinary jobs suddenly found themselves confronted with extraordinary things. Uh, the director of the Internal Revenue Service, the commissioner of the Internal Revenue Service, Johnny Walker. One day, John Dean went to him and said, here's a list of 500 people that we want audited. And they were all supporters of uh, the Democratic candidate, George McGovern. And uh, Johnny Walker, who up until that time had had a very kind of normal life and existence, um, he said, no, sorry. <laughs> and he went to his boss, the Treasury Secretary, George Schultz, and said, John Dean has just told me that I have to audit 500 McGovern supporters. And George Schultz, who of course had not led an ordinary life, George, said, uh, George Schultz said, uh, no, don't let him do that. And if he asks again, tell him to come to me. And there were many, many, many things like that. Many things like that. There were FBI agents who were angry that clearly their inquiries about where the money came from were not being paid attention to, and they got angry about that. And sometimes they leaked, sometimes they screamed at their superiors, uh, some people resigned. So I, I found all of that very moving and very interesting and very important, and I wanted to put all of those issues and decisions in the context of the larger scale systemic issues that we faced then and that we may soon face again. Um, and so that, of course, had to be a very, very different film, a uh, much harder film to make, uh, so I found myself putting, putting myself back into seriousness mode and ending, you know, ending up making a, a fourth very serious film. You've said that um, at the time that this was all happening, Watergate, you were, you were following it very closely. You were riveted by what was going on, as were many Americans. Um, but what, in revisiting this and really digging deep into this and talking with some of the folks on this panel and others, um, what surprised you? What caught you off guard? What, what did you learn that you didn't think you know or what, what were you challenged by 
What did you learn was different from what you maybe thought? Well, I, le I learned a lot of things. First of all, I have to say, uh, now that you've seen the film, you can, I'm sure you can uh, understand this, what an extraordinary honor and experience it was to be able to interview these people, uh, to speak with them. It was really, you know. Um, and, and they put up with me for quite long periods of time, I have to say. I was quite inquisitive for poor Richard Benvenisti. You know, I think I filmed you for almost five hours. Most of a day, I think. Poor man. Uh, I, I, a number of things surprised me. Uh, one thing that I had not realized was the level of implicit, not usually not explicit, sometimes I think explicit, but usually implicit coordination among uh, the various groups who were working on this, um, and and there are you know there are flaws in the system, partially flaws that come from the Constitution being over 200 years old, partially flaws from the way the Constitution has been interpreted, partially flaws from laws that have been passed. So it was it, it was important, very important, I think, that the special prosecutors issued their subpoenas when they did, and that those were criminal subpoenas, not uh, congressional subpoenas. It was very important that the Supreme Court decided that for the first time in its history, it was gonna stay in session through July and hear this case, and just by coincidence, rule on it the day that the impeachment debate was starting. You know, that, those things were important. And I think that, I, I don't think that for the most part, they came from all these people getting in a room together. I think that what it came from was just a widely shared purpose, a widely shared sense that this was just too important to leave to normal behavior. Let me um, turn to you. And um, I see a number of hands already waving, and the one that's moving the most, I'm going to start here uh, with the microphone. So just wait for the microphone so that those recording this can have can hear your question. Like, uh, like all of you, I, I wallowed in Watergate my whole life. <laughs> and I remember you, Ms. Holtzman, from Brooklyn, because I grew up in the same district, when you beat, uh, defeated Emanuel Seller. What year was that, 72? 72. Uh, but anyway, there were two great ladies on your committee, you and Barbara Jordan. And when I saw you both, it, it really brought tears to my eyes. It was, uh, terrific, just terrific. And uh, I wanted to ask this, someone, uh, another person who brought tears to my eyes was uh, Sam Irvin. Can you, uh, one of you please comment about his role? Because as a young man, I remember watching him on TV, and I was just so... Uh, so impressed with his manner, and it was just uh, very special and different. And I really thought he, he brought home the importance of what he was doing, Sam Irvin. He was one of the great heroes. He was just the country lawyer who knew Shakespeare, and I think every, every phrase of the Bible and often elevated the hearings and kept them on balance and kept them as fair as was possible. Um, he, there are so many heroes, and I didn't want to leave the impression that I didn't think Sirica was a hero in this. Um, can I just, before I stop talking, um, say something to Charles? You know, there, uh, as to what you just said, there are heroes in the press today. Uh, I think that the press in Washington is just doing an extraordinary job in what's going on right now. And there are I agree. obviously tons and tons of leakers all over the government, the White House, and ironically, Bob Woodward is back in the game uh, t telling us that there's a resistance. So, you know, you have to take heart that what went on then, and at the time, we didn't know it was going on. You know, and we got, as a reporter, disheartened. I, th I remember many times thinking, this story is dead, and uh, n n we're never going to get beyond this point. And then something happened, and we did, so. 
Do you have a similar feeling now at times that that uh, yeah, impatience or a doubt that we might get to the truth? Yeah, a lot. But but there's no question that the press is carrying the burden, mm -hmm. uh, notwithstanding the changes in press and the, the multiple uh, different organs that uh, allow people often in total ignorance uh, to amplify their thoughts. Um, but the, the press has carried the load where Congress has fallen and has not done it and where uh, Bob Mueller is doing exactly what he should be doing and that is not leaking until the time that wow. he uh, uh, issues a report or issues another speaking indictment, uh, which he has done in uh, at least uh, two, maybe three instances so far, there's a vacuum in public education coming from government, and that vacuum uh, is in the House and Senate, which have not had any kind of robust investigation, uh, despite the efforts of some. Uh, because the majority controls the chairs of all of the relevant uh, committees. So the press has kept this alive largely um, through the newspapers and through television. And we will see whether it gets handed off in a meaningful way uh, and whether Mueller is protected to the extent of issuing his report and there are some people who think that he may actually replicate something which uh, we did in Watergate, which is to transmit evidence to the House of Representatives, to Congress, um, that we alone were in possession of. Uh, and that was an important, a very important step, as you saw in the film. Uh, to providing the ultimate evidence that uh, essentially destroyed Nixon's partisan supporters. Um, I, I just want to follow up on what Richard said about that. I think that um, the public education function has, and this goes back to Irvin, the public education function has not functioned properly because Mueller, as he must, and as the grand jury must, conducts investigations in secret. And their work product should be an indictment, and if it can't be an indictment, uh, we won't get into whether it should be an indictment or not, but if it can't be an indictment because people think a president can't be indicted, then at least there could be uh, some kind of report. But I remember the Saturday Night Massacre would never have had, in my opinion, the impact that it did in galvanizing the American people to demand an impeachment inquiry if the public hadn't understood the significance of the tapes. The tapes were going to prove whether Nixon was right in saying, I never authorized the payment of hush money, or whether John Dean was right. And had the public know that because the Senate Watergate Committee had hearings that John Dean appeared at. So the American people got a full sense of this. I just want to pay tribute to Senator Irvin. I don't really know that I, I didn't really know him well, but when I came to Congress, there was a bill that the Nixon administration wanted to sneak through, which was going to create an official secrets act that might have actually stopped some of the information about Watergate. And I introduced a bill in the House and I didn't know Sam Irvin from anybody, from a hole in the wall, and he's the one who got it passed in the Senate. So he was a very astute constitutional scholar, but on top of that, he understood the stakes, and he orchestrated the Senate hearings in a, in a way that all of us can be proud of so many years later. And without dissent, they voted to subpoena the tapes. Everyone, Republicans and Democrats. Would that happen today? I don't think so. I think we'd hear speeches about executive privilege from those people who don't want that information to come out. Let's go to another question. We're here in the second row and then the front row. Second row and then front row. Oh. Yes. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Sorry. 
Thank you. Um, people remember where they say they only remember where they were when uh, Kennedy was killed. I remember August, uh, that day in August of 78, uh, I mean, 74, being on my aunt's when I listened on the radio as an eight year old listening to Richard Nixon resign. Um, I wanted to, I, first of all, congratulate you, Mr. Ferguson, on a, the most thorough film I've seen the day documentary on Watergate, and I've seen all of them. As, as thorough as the inside job did as the best thing on the financial uh, crisis. My question is, though, is um, one thing you did sort of leave out, I was sort of disappointed and surprised. Uh, prior to the plumbers, prior to Nixon actually being inaugurated in 69, his campaign team, uh, through, Nick, uh, through Kissinger and others, sabotaged the Paris peace talks. And their real dirty tricks sort of began then. Uh, they sabotaged the peace talks. They knew that Johnson had tapes that his play, all campaign play might have been bugged and that Johnson might have had that material over him, which increases paranoia. I sort of know this, uh, my own personal connection is, many years ago I worked with Christopher Hitchens and we wrote a book, he wrote a book in Harper's about uh, Kiss, Kinster's role in this, about, uh, and so I heard, Seymour Hirsch wrote also similar. Right, well, it, it, it is true that, uh, that Nixon and Haldeman uh, did sabotage the Paris peace negotiations. I left it out of the film for two reasons. One is, you know, you can only put so much in the film. The other is that there's considerable dispute as to how significant this was. It did, it did occur. Uh, Mr. Nixon had employed a variety of smear tactics and dirty tricks earlier in his career. Uh, he was no stranger to that kind of behavior. Uh, and so I just sufficed or satisfied myself with a, a general brief statement of that fact rather than going into that particular or other possible instances. But yes, it, it, it is true. It was, and it was recently confirmed by uh, a biographer uh, who's in the film, John Farrell. Let's take another question right here. Hi. Yes, I also would like to um, congratulate all of the uh, panelists for an extraordinary achievement. And honestly, thank you also because not being uh, old enough at the time, it has really helped me understand uh, what happened and the extraordinary events. And um, observing from today's perspective what happened then, it seems to me that what happened were sort of small events, um, and I don't want to diminish them, a break-in, that obviously led to very grave behavior that is not acceptable. But then comparing that to today, my feeling is that what we're witnessing over and over and over again is extraordinarily grave behavior by our leaders. And I would like to know if, if the panelists believe that that is a fair comparison, fair observation. And also, um, uh, and it, that, that's my question, if, if, if that comparison is fair or not, uh, today's behavior versus what happened back then. So I think it is entirely fair. Uh, many people say a lesson of Watergate is you get caught in the cover-up. And Watergate was about exposing a massive cover-up of what some have called a two-bit burglary. Uh, it was more than that, of course. But today, there's an ongoing investigation about a massive crime, not just a cover-up, but an underlying crime potentially involving the president. And in Watergate, there was never any proof that Nixon himself, President Nixon, had committed the crime of authorizing the break-in, directing the break-in, may have known about general activities, but not pinned to that. That's a different situation today. The underlying crime is being investigated for uh, White House and presidential involvement. Um, can I differ? <laughs> uh, I think that one of the problems is that people don't appreciate the full scope of Watergate. If you want to start with even the point that the gentleman made before, Watergate, before President Nixon even was elected, he was seeking the help of a foreign government in undermining the election process in the United States. I just want to say, same old, same old. So let's not just bypass what happened then. We have a very interesting precedent. 
He conducted a war against the wishes of Congress. We tried to stop the bombing of Cambodia. He, he kept it going. People died, Americans died. We don't have that today, but that was extremely serious. And in fact, it was. And the leaks about the bombing of Cambodia in the New York Times led Nixon to start a campaign of illegal wiretaps of journalists and others. That is extremely serious. It's not a cover-up. That's criminal behavior, except a president can't commit a crime, so it's not criminal. But that happened. He also authorized the break-in into Daniel uh, Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office to get information to smear him. Daniel Ellsberg was on trial for alleged, uh, I forget, espionage or something or other to do with the Pentagon Papers, interfering with the civil liberties of an American citizen. That was extremely serious. Nixon approved the Houston plan. That was to a plan to break into people's homes without court orders of people who were dissenters, called radicals, or read other words, anti-war anti -war activists. So we had an enemies list, the, the IRS abuses. So to say that we are talking about a third-rate burglary just repeats, I don't know what to say about it, but in a way, it's a Republican propaganda because what happened under Nixon was extremely serious and threatened our liberties. And let's not forget about that. And so the, the result here was really important. I think that <clears throat> the problem is that presidents, when they get into office and even before they get into office, think that they have power to do whatever they want. And, uh, and I, I, that's what Watergate was about. So it's not a third-rate burglary and it's not a cover-up of something minor. It is, tr is true <laughs> that the uh, uh, impeachment article based on abuse of power, the enemies list, the COINTEL program, those things you mentioned, did get one more vote. The obstruction of justice article was based on a cover-up. I think today what we have is more like Article 2 than like Article 1, these abuses of power that go well beyond a cover-up. I agree with Liz on everything she said, but I want to point out it doesn't matter whether Richard Nixon knew about the break-in. Obviously, he had fostered the environment that led to the creation of the plumber's unit that did it, and he found out about it the next day and immediately started to use the CIA to stop the FBI from investigating because, remember, he knew that the money that paid those burglars came from campaign contributions. He was protecting CREEP, the Committee to Reelect the President. He was protecting the White House. There was unlimited cash in the White House safes that was being used to hush the burglars up. And it doesn't matter to me whether Donald Trump knew that his son was having this meeting to get dirt on Hillary, which is an illegal crime. It's a campaign violation that's very serious because it involves, again, a foreign power in an enemy of ours. And first of all, I don't believe that he didn't know. That seems incredible to me. But even if he didn't, his conduct in not taking action against Russia to protect the American election is another crime that he should be charged with and should be investigated for. Right. So I think that there are more similarities than there are dissimilarities. You I are think both are serious. You are correct in saying that uh, what was very artfully dismissed by the White House propaganda machine as a third-rate burglary provided the inflection point for more serious inquiries into what Mr. Nixon and those around him were doing. The uh, parallels to the current situation are so numerous uh, starting with uh, one party uh, utilizing electronic means, uh, perhaps with the assistance of a foreign power here in conjunction with them, aiding and abetting them, whatever word you want to use, which is the subject legitimately of a very critical investigation. This is a foreign power attacking the cornerstone of our democratic process, our uh, right to vote, and our right to have free and fair elections. 
And so uh, the parallels uh, go on and on about hush money, about perjury, about uh, individuals uh, seeking to commit various related crimes. But we're not at full stop here. Where we are is where Archie Cox was, in a sense. No charges have been brought, and it is fundamentally contrary to our system of justice to come to conclusions about illegal conduct until the investigator who's in charge of that has the opportunity to conclude his investigation. And that's where the American public have to rise up, go into the streets if necessary, and Liz knows I've said this many times before, to protect the integrity of the investigation conducted by an unbiased and extraordinarily well-credentialed investigator in Bob Mueller. So until we have that point where what he knows is made available to the public in some legitimate form, uh, we simply don't have the wherewithal to say other than where there's smoke, there's fire, and it gives us good cause to require the conclusion of the investigation. Um, so many parallels, not yet there. We are, um, we are out of time and we're gonna move uh, swiftly to wrap this up so that we can make way for another screening in this house. If you're interested in a number of the topics we've been talking about today, there's a movie by Errol Morris later tonight. Um, uh, in which he interrogates Steve Bannon. That movie uh, still has some tickets available, so I invite you to that later. Um, I want to thank, for his magnificent film, Charles Ferguson, and I want to thank everyone on this panel. Thank you very much.